You've probably heard the story of Isaac Newton's apple tree. Newton sits under a tree, apple falls on his head, he wonders how did this happen, then Newton goes on to document gravity, blah 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 blah, you know the story from there. But if gravity makes things fall, then why hasn't this 419,000 kilogram hunk of metal crashed and burned yet? And what does that have to do with the video game? That and more in this episode of Crash Course Physics. This is a planet, and this is Jim. He's a rocket. So Jim here wants to go to space, and since space is up, I guess we'll go up. We are out of fuel. Well, sh Just like Newton's apple from earlier, Jimmy fell back to Earth. Gravity is pulling him down, and since Earth is a sphere, regardless of where you launch from, gravity's always gonna pull you back down. Okay, well, if gravity pulls toward the center of our planet, let's launch Jim sideways. Wait. Jim's dead. Alright, Bob, you're next. Oh, hey, look. Bob's still flying without fuel. Oh, oh no. Hmm, what if we go both up and sideways? Alice, you're up. Look, Alice ran out of fuel, but she's still flying. Alice has reached what's called an orbit. Alice is both simultaneously falling back towards Earth and falling sideways away from Earth causing her to get stuck in a loop, essentially, around the Earth. And that is the basis of orbital mechanics. Now that we've covered orbital mechanics at a 5th grade level, let's get a little bit more complex. We're going to go over two main focus points, escape velocity and circular orbits. To help demonstrate these two points, we're going to use a state-of-the-art, NASA-approved simulator, also known as Kerbal Space Program, a video game about building, flying, and exploding rockets. Alright, let's go back to our example with Jim from earlier. Escape velocity is simply the velocity at which the rocket, Jim, must be going to escape the gravitational pull of the planet. This pull is known as the sphere of influence. In order to calculate the escape velocity, we need to ultimately find the change in velocity v, also known as delta v. This is measured in meters per second. Now that we know the terms, we're going to calculate the escape velocity of this Earth-like planet called Kerbin, and then build a rocket using our calculations. The first part we need to understand is that this is an energy problem. You've probably heard of the Law of Conservation of Energy, which states that the total energy in a system stays constant. We can turn this to an equation form like so. The initial potential energy plus the initial kinetic energy is equal to the final potential energy plus the final kinetic energy. So what does this mean for us? Well, in order to reach escape velocity, we want our final energy to equal zero. So we can set our final kinetic and potentials to zero. On the other side, we need the equation for gravitational potential energy, which is described as so. The negative of the gravitational constant times the mass of the planet times the mass of our rocket, all divided by the radius from the center of the planet. Taking that equation, we can place it on the left side of the energy balance from earlier to get something similar to this, where u initial was replaced with the gravitational potential energy equation. Note that the initial kinetic velocity is what we'll solve for to get our delta v. We can then isolate k initial on one side and get a positive GPE. From there, we can replace k initial with the equation for kinetic energy and get a result of 1 half mv squared escape is equal to the equation for gravitational potential energy. The lowercase m's then cancel, and after some quick algebra, we're left with our equation for velocity v. Now, it's time to plug in some numbers. First, we need to know the mass of our planet Kerbin. Luckily, we already know that. How? Don't ask. Next comes our radius r, or the distance from the surface to the center of mass. And finally, we already know g, that's the gravitational constant. If we plug all that in, that then leaves us with a resultant delta v of 3,437 meters per second. Wow, that's fast. Alright, it's rocket time.
Now that we've built our beautiful rocket, here you can see the delta V of this spacecraft, it's as close as we could get to our calculated value. Okay, so we didn't make it. The main reason for this is a little something called air resistance. If we go back to this part here, look at how hot the rocket is getting. The air in the atmosphere is pushing back against it, slowing it down considerably. Had we been going the full 3,437 meters per second, we probably would have made it. Now, let's go back to Alice from earlier. She's in what we call a circular orbit, as she is always a fixed distance r from the center of the planet. Alright, now back on Kerbin, let's say we've got a satellite in orbit around Kerbin, and we want to dock with it. We need to know how fast it's going. The good news is, it's easy to calculate. Since the height h and the velocity v are constant, the math is relatively easy. It's so easy in fact, we can actually use the same equation from the escape velocity. Well. Almost. See, it looks similar because we're deriving from the same gravitational potential energy equation. However, a few things are different now that we have two masses, the planet and the rocket. But let's solve. We need to first define an L, or fixed distance we want our orbit to be at. We'll assume 120,000 meters for this. Naturally, a slight problem with that is that our L is relative to the surface of Kerbin, instead of the center. To account for that, we're going to take the radius r of the planet and add that to the 120,000 meters. So, we get an equation where L is equal to r plus h, where r is the radius of Kerbin and h is the height of our orbit. Now, we just plug in our numbers from before. We do have the new mass of our satellite to add to this, but we know this from building our satellite. After solving, we get a relative velocity of 2,219 meters per second. Time to go to the satellite and see how close we were. As we can see with our satellite, our orbit velocity ended up around 2180 meters per second. Our calculated velocity, if we recall, was 2219 meters per second. This gives us a percent error of only 1.7%. But why were we wrong? Well, for starters, the orbit in our simulation wasn't a perfect circle. There was actually about a 10,000 meter difference between our apoapsis and periapsis. This was due to human error. Now, let's go back to the start. Remember the International Space Station? That heap of metal floating in space right now follows the same principles of Alice's rocket and the satellite. Don't believe me? Try it out. The ISS is floating at around 410 kilometers above the Earth's surface. The mass of the Earth, as we know it, is around 5.6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. And do you remember the mass of the ISS? Pause the video and see if you can calculate the velocity of the ISS. Don't forget the radius of the Earth. If you got anywhere around 7,600 meters per second, then you did it right. Now, you may be wondering, why did you not get it exactly right? And why were our tests in KSB not right either? Does math lie? No. Math doesn't lie. We simply didn't account for the sources of error. Unlike Alice's perfect world, our world has many more variables to disrupt our rockets. One of the largest forces is that of air resistance, which can apply a force in the opposite direction. As for the ISS, well, it's not a perfect circular orbit either. The orbit is slightly elliptical with a periapsis of about 408 kilometers and an apoapsis of 410 kilometers. With Alice endlessly trapped in space, three rockets exploded, and you calculating the speed of a giant metal box, I think it's safe to say this has been a brief overview of orbital mechanics.